the Dallas Stars have a little bit of extra time off before they take on the Minnesota Wild again on Friday. So we're going to change things up on today's episode. I'm joined by Stephen Meserve, who covers the Texas Stars in the AHL. The Texas Stars are gearing up for their own playoff run, which will start on Friday. And on today's episode, me and Stephen get you caught up on everything you need to know about the Dallas Stars AHL affiliate, the Texas Stars, and how far they can go in the Calder Cup playoffs on today's episode of Locked On Stars. Your Locked On Stars, your daily podcast on the Dallas Stars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, Stars fans. Welcome back to the Locked On Stars podcast, the only daily podcast covering the Dallas Stars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Dane Lewis, your local expert on all things Dallas Stars hockey, coming to you on this Thursday, April 27th. And whether this is your first time here or you are a recurring listener, thank you for stopping by and making Locked On Stars your first listen every single day. Be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts at. We're always free and available no matter where or how you choose to listen. We got a great episode on tap for you today. Of course, the Stars still in a battle uh, with the Minnesota Wild in their first round playoff series. But with the extended break here uh, with two days off for both teams, I wanted to take a minute and highlight the AHL Texas Stars as they're about to begin a playoff run of their own on Friday. So they'll be going up against the Rockford Ice Hogs. But I brought in a Texas Stars expert in Stephen Meserve, a guy who has been covering the team since 2009. He recently put out a book with Sean Shapiro called We Win Here. We talk a little bit about his book. We talk a little bit about this Texas Stars team and what we can expect from them and several of their players. We talk about Maverick Bork, Matte Blumel, Antonio Stranges, Matt Murray, a really good conversation with Steven today. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So let's not hesitate anymore and get into today's conversation with Steven Meserve. Joining me now on today's episode, a very special guest here to give us some insight on the AHL and the Texas Stars as they get ready to begin their playoff journey on Friday. Steven Meserve uh, covering the Texas Stars, I believe since 2009, uh, an expert on the team and also just released a book, a co-author, uh, with Sean Shapiro, a book called We Win Here, the first book written exclusively uh, about the Texas Stars. And uh, Stephen, I kind of want to start there. If you want to give us a little bit of insight uh, about this book. I mean, I was looking into it before we recorded today. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of great content in there from names, uh, players that, you know, people that follow the Dallas Stars and the Texas Stars know and love. Uh, I know I saw Jamie Benn somewhere in there, a foreword by Curtis McKenzie. Uh, give us some insight on this book that that you and Sean just put out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Dane. It's a, um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, there's a pretty small group of folks over the years who've covered the AHL's Texas Stars. And I've covered them since 2009. Sean was there from 2012 until uh, 2016, 17, when he moved on to the Dallas beat. And one of those things that we always talked about was, you know, we'd go to the bar after the game. There's a BJ's brew house right down the road from the Cedar Park Center. And we'd chat and say, you know, man, you know, this is a really interesting topic. That thing, can you believe that? Oh man, remember that one story when that one thing happened? Man, that'd be cool if we wrote a book about that someday. And then we'd order another beer and I'll, and go home later. Um, and finally we got down to it and Sean called me in uh, January and said, you know, hey, I think, I think it's about time to write that book. And so it's a collection of essays. So it's not a chronological book where we talk about topics that cover the Texas Stars and the AHL. So things that will be really interesting to Dallas fans. The very first essay talks about Jamie Benn's time in that 2010 playoffs. We have one essay where we talk about the fact that the way the organization handled and in some cases mishandled Jack Campbell's development led to the success that Jake Ottinger is now experiencing in the NHL because the organization learned from some of the mistakes. And we talk about what those mistakes are and some of the behind the scenes. But also we talk about some of the stuff that the AHL specific fans would really love. Um, and I really want to make sure that Dallas fans understand that the AHL isn't a black box. You can't just shove prospects in one side and have them come out be NHL players on the other side. There's a lot of really interesting things that happen at this level um, that you need to consider if you really want to be a fully baked hockey fan to understand what is coming next to the Dallas Stars. So super excited to talk about uh, those things here today. And if you're interested in reading more about the book, 
Again, as you said, Dane, it's called We Win Here. And you just go to wewinhere.com and it'll take you right to the link. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's obviously a very exciting project and one that I'm sure I'll even be looking into. And hopefully uh, people listening and watching this will also take a look at. Uh, and one one question I do have about that, and obviously don't want to spoil too much about the book, but what, what was some of that, I guess, movement from, from Jack Campbell? What, what was that situation like to where, you know, now we see Jake Ottinger who is, you know, spent his time with the Texas Stars, but now he's a, I mean, bona fide superstar in the NHL on the cusp of getting the Dallas Stars to round two uh, of the Stanley Cup playoffs here in 2023. Just just to give the people a little bit of a, a sneak peek, uh, if you yeah, will. Definitely. I mean, what, what was that whole ordeal like? Because I know, I, I mean, the Jack Campbell situation, obviously not ideal, but it seems like, I mean, good organizations find a way to adapt and, and learn from their mistakes. And it seems like just based on what you've said, uh, that that's something that they were able to do, uh, at least with you know the way that they've managed goalies over the past few seasons. So one thing you have to think about is the fact that when the team started here in 2009, there were only two coaches on the staff. We had Glenn Gullitson and Paul Girard behind the bench, but now there are five coaches, including a goalie coach. And the goalie coach, Ryan Daniels, is here every day to make sure guys like Matt Murray and before that, Jake Ottinger, were being prepared for being future Dallas stars. And one of the things to consider is when Jack was here, Jack Campbell, his main you know, contact was maybe a veteran goalie who he was talking to, Christopher Nielstorp or someone like that. But Christopher Nielstorp was also concerned with his own development and making sure that he won games. Mike Valley was the goalie coach for the Dallas Stars, but his main job was making sure that Kari Lettinen was ready to win games for the Dallas Stars today. He didn't have as much bandwidth to go out and come down to Cedar Park, do observation, things like that, to make sure that Jack was continuing to develop. And so, you know, as I said, a little bit of it is on Jack, a little bit of, on, of it is on the organization. And when you look at it, they learned from that. They said, okay, we need a goalie coach in Texas. We need to have a strong plan to make sure that we don't put too much on Jake Ottinger also too early in his career. Um, they gave him those extra few games at the beginning of last season in the AHL, and then he never came back, Right. And he's undefe- undisputed starter and future of the Dallas Stars organization in net. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Jack Campbell sort of had to had to sink so that Jake Ottinger could swim. And so it's an interesting dichotomy. Really, you can argue that Jake Ottinger's success with the Dallas Stars started in 2010 before he even knew that he was going to be drafted by them, because that's when Jack Campbell got drafted. And that's when the story really began. Yeah, that, it's crazy to, to think about it that way, but I mean, it, it seems to have worked out pretty well for the Stars and even Jack Campbell, who who's found his way on a Edmonton Oilers roster right now. They're in the thick of it in the playoffs as well. Uh, a pretty decent tandem there with Stuart Skinner up with uh, Connor McDavid and company, but uh, obviously uh, really exciting stuff there, and I'm sure there's even more uh, in the book. Remember, everyone listening at home, it's called We Win Here, uh, and I'm, I'll put a link to it in the description of today's podcast. But Stephen, moving on to today's team kind of the current state of the texas stars they seem to be in a really good place they've won their division uh for the first time since 2014 which uh, the year that they won the calder cup if i'm not mistaken a team that featured guys like roddick foxa who's with the dallas stars right now jamie alexiak Uh, if i was if my research earlier was correct was on that team he was once a fan favorite in dallas and now a member of the seattle kraken organization And, and it seems like it's it's been a while since we've seen the texas stars you know, win a division uh, and have a team that looks this good. I mean, my sample size of what I've seen from them is pretty small, but I mean, everything I've read and seen given some of the players has been, there's been a lot of high praise for this Texas Stars team. Was this something that was expected this year? Because I know there's been plenty of players that have kind of gone up and down, uh, some guys that have needed to fill in at the NHL level and, you know, going back and forth. Was this something that you were expecting with this year's Texas Stars team, the way they finished? I knew this team was going to be good. I you look at the roster, they have great prospects, right? You've got Maverick Bork and Mate Blumel. You have Thomas Harley for most of the year, but they also did a great job of getting the more veteran guys on the roster to continue to fill out and help to develop all of those players as well. Fill out that roster. you got a guy like Riley Barber, who, you know, didn't get a call up to Dallas, but he's a veteran AHL guy, point per game type of player. You need him. You need guys like Tanner Caro. Curtis McKenzie, who's the captain of the team on an AHL deal to fill out that roster. I mean, honestly, one of the biggest questions coming into this year was goaltending because they had everything else figured out. It felt like it was going to be a solid defense with a lot of returning players, solid forward group with a lot of returning players. 
at Media Day last week, uh, one of the questions to Curtis McKenzie was who Curtis McKenzie, who was on the 2014 and the 2018 Calder Cup final teams, and they won in 2014 when he was Rookie of the Year. He uh, he said that this is the second best team he's ever been on. Um, he said the 2014 was 14 team was far and away an incredible team, but this is the second best team he's ever been on, and that is high praise because he has gone not only with the Texas Stars twice already to the Calder Cup final. He also went with the Chicago Wolves to the Calder Cup final while he was away from the Dallas organization. So him saying that this was the second best team that he's ever been on is high praise. And additionally, from the numbers side of things, it's also the second best Texas Stars team statistically as well. They uh, they had a goal this year to, I mean, they would have loved obviously to, to beat the 2014 team if they could have, but they wanted to, to be just behind them in terms of winning percentage. And they did do that with our last segment of games. So that was something that head coach Neil Graham was extremely proud of, and he should be um, coming in second best on a team that has gone already to the Calder Cup final three times in their history. More Texas Stars talk with Stephen Meserve coming up in just a second. But first, got to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. You're looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories? Then you need the best tasting protein bar ever built. I'm, of course, talking about Built Bars. If you're like me, you want to make healthier snack choices but you don't want to compromise taste. I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars are healthy and they taste amazing. What makes them so incredible? What makes them taste so amazing? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real dark chocolate, and they come in unbelievably delicious flavors such as churro, peanut butter brownie, and my personal favorite, cookies and cream. And I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros at only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and 17 grams of protein. And you can get them really anywhere. For the longest time, you could only order them online at Built.com. But now you can pick them up at your local Walmart or your local Sam's Club. And be sure to check out Built.com for some exclusive online-only flavors and get all the information you could ever want on Built Bars. Be sure to get your hands on some Built Bars today because they will absolutely change your life. Yeah, I mean, that does seem like high praise for a guy, Curtis McKenzie, who's been around the game for a while. And you mentioned some of the the big name players, and I want to highlight some of those guys. Thomas Harley, uh, an AHL All-Star this season, but now he's seemingly graduated, it seems, to the NHL. He's performed well with the Dallas Stars, and I would imagine it's the hope of Pete DeBoer and the coaching staff up in Dallas that he can make that jump next season to being a full-time NHLer. How, How big of an impact is it to lose a guy like Harley going into the postseason? Because he's he's clearly not the only talented player on the team, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But just given how skilled he is and how vital he was to the production from the blue line, how how do you replace that kind of player uh, heading into a postseason run? It's interesting because Harley... um... You know, he he does a lot of great things, right? And and his defensive game this season has developed, you know, his gap control, mm-hmm. his, you know, the way that he um, cuts off plays, his is just his skate, he's using his skating in a more defensive way as opposed to a more offensive way. And I mean, those are the things that made it so that once he got called up, he I, I mean, he's never coming back. Like, let's be real here. He's playing, doing well, playing very well in Stanley Cup playoff games, hard minutes. Um, and he's never playing another game for the Texas Stars again. And that that was by design, right? It would have been, maybe he would have gone a little bit earlier if there had been more injuries in the lineup. And honestly, that's something that's true at the forward and defensive uh, core. Um, the defense really didn't shift a lot this year in Dallas and therefore didn't shift a lot in Texas either. So as far as what Texas has without him in the lineup, um, he was constantly paired with Will Butcher, uh, who's a veteran AHL and NHL defenseman. Um, Butcher is now paired with Oscari Loxtonen, who was picked up in the organization uh, in a trade for Joe Ciccone, uh out to the Buffalo organization. Um, you know, it's I, I think that the the top pairing of uh, Ryan Shea and Alex Petrovic, obviously they're not going anywhere. They were arguably the best five on five defensive pairing in the entire AHL. They set records for plus minus. I know from behind the scenes and in stat, their their uh, advanced fancy metrics are all off the charts. Um, So they're going to get the hardest minutes. I think they've had uh, a good seventh defenseman all year in Michael Caro, who's played about 30 something games, uh, 36, as I look at the stats here. Um, So they've got a guy who can jump into the lineup, but Michael Caro is not Thomas Harley. Um, So it'll be interesting, interesting to see how those, 
uh, that pairing of Ben Gleason and Michael Caro uh, is able to play uh, as they roll into the playoffs here. Um, they showed well in the last few games of the season, but playoffs are a different game. Absolutely. And Rockford is a hard draw for, for that first round against them. Absolutely. Playoffs always drastically different from the regular season, no matter the level of hockey, the game just changes drastically. And it's always interesting to see how players adjust and adapt to that. And Harley has done an excellent job, like you mentioned, uh, playing in the Stanley Cup playoffs and uh, really not looking back and really embracing this role that he's gotten. But there's plenty of other players I want to highlight, including one who I know Dallas Stars fans are anxiously awaiting the arrival of at the NHL level. Maverick Bork, he's been a hot topic of discussion ever since he was drafted by the organization in 2020. What's it been like watching him this season? How have you seen his game develop? And when do you think he'll be ready to make that jump? Because, uh, I mean, you're watching other guys like Wyatt Johnston or Logan Stankoven who, you know, go straight from their junior teams to the NHL. Maverick Bork obviously making a stop here in the AHL at the Texas Stars. But, I mean, that's not a bad thing. Some, some players, it just takes a little bit longer for them to get to the NHL. When do you expect that to happen for Bork? And what's it been like watching him this season? Yeah, Bork is interesting because he came in on an amateur tryout uh, at the end of the last season. And watching his game, it, it's pretty fascinating because you could see immediately that his hockey sense and vision on the ice was just, just jumped off the page at you, right? It was absolutely apparent from, from the first moment. He had, I would say, though, a rocky start to the season. His first several months up until about the Christmas break were not probably the game that he wanted. And it talking to Texas stars, GM, Scott white, he said, you know, they had conversations about it. He knew um, that he needed to improve his game. And it's his first time playing against men, right? Uh, he's, he's going from playing against 16 to 20 year olds to playing against 20 to 35 year olds, guys who their entire job is playing hockey professionally. Um, Coming back from the Christmas break, there was a big shift in his game, and he's been able to be more of the offensive talent that he he should be in order to become a Dallas star. One of the interesting things, especially when you compare a player like Maverick Bork against guys like Rhett Gardner or Riley Tufty, is that Bork, his game may need to be one of those where he needs to be in the top six to do his thing. And that starts to be a, a, a difficult situation because if you don't have a spot in him for the top six, can he do the things that make him a potential NHL player in a bottom six role? Maybe, maybe not. So I'd say that his development curve lengthens a little bit because of the, the top six role that he probably will need to fill. And in order to get into the Dallas lineup, he's going to need to do things that um, would be more required of a bottom six player, be more defensively responsible, penalty kill, these sorts of things, so that he can earn his way in to eventually a top six role by being in that bottom six first, um, unless he just completely blows away in training camp next year and they put him in that top six somehow. Um, but I think that his game lends itself more and based on where he's been drafted and what everyone's expecting from him. That's the sort of challenge of his development. But I think it's entirely possible he gets called. He starts to get call ups next year based on injuries and who's in and out. Um, and I, I think the development in his game has been, a, no pun intended, a hockey stick uh, since Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's exciting to hear that you know that, that the growth is there and obviously it maybe hasn't been the smoothest road. And it's, I know it's been weird for him too getting drafted, uh, you know, in in the middle of a pandemic and his journey probably a little bit bizarre. But I mean, it'd be interesting to see him get the call up at some point next season, temporary call up or, or even, you know, a permanent one. Like you said, if he is able to blow away the coaching staff and, and, you know, things of that nature, it's one of the exciting things about watching hockey prospects is you never really know what you're always going to get. Uh, but Maverick Bork, certainly uh, an exciting player to keep an eye on is, as, as is Mate Blumel, uh, who has made his NHL debut, spent most of the season with the Texas stars in Cedar park, but his brief stints in the NHL, he didn't look too bad. What, what, what's been your take on him this season? Because I know he's a guy that kind of has flown under the radar. I believe he was drafted by Edmonton, but then the Stars were able to pick him up. I think he was a fourth or fifth round pick. So not a ton of uh, attention or you know spotlights shined on his name, but it seems like he's really kind of found his footing uh, here in this organization. It looks like a, a, a sleeper type player uh, that could have a really nice NHL career at some point. Yeah, it's interesting because Mate Blumel is a little bit of an opposite of Matt Bork. He had he got shot out of a rocket 
uh, out of a cannon at the beginning of, beginning of the season, just really fast, um, you know, earned, I believe, a player of the week. I, I wrote a feature about him at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. He had a really great start and then hit kind of a wall midway through the season and didn't produce as much um, as, as he went through the season. Um, and then toward the end of the year, he had a, a scary injury that happened where he, uh, he got uh, taken off the ice on a stretcher. And uh, there was just a lot of concern about, obviously, his ability to return. He has returned. It's pretty, pretty great to see that he played regular season games to end the year. Um, and he's, he's back, indeed, to, to continue playing through the playoffs. Um, I think that, you know, it's one of those things where, again, playing against men for the first time um, and, and that experience that you needed, he, like I said, hit the wall. But I think he's got a lot of veteran savvy around him. They put him on, on lines with vets who can really help him and help develop his game. He actually lives with Marian Studenich, who it's funny that I'm calling him a vet at all of 25 or 26 <laughs> years old, but five or six years of experience is a lot of experience when you're talking about careers that only last maybe 10 years at most. Um, so, you know, that, that uh, pairing, uh, they're apparently able to speak their native tongues to each other, uh, Czech and Slovakian, because they're like British and American English, uh, according to, according to Blumel. Um, they just speak in native tongues to each other and every once in a while have a bit of a misunderstanding. Um, so it, I, I think he's, he's a player who's going to take a little bit longer. Um, I wouldn't expect to see him on the starting roster next year, especially with the way that the stars have stacked up, uh, have stacked up the players in the top six, like we mm-hmm. talked about with Bork, but I think he makes a good call up option. Um, and, and a guy who, um, you know, has, like you said, that sleeper quality to him, uh, Edmonton drafted him and then didn't sign him uh, at the deadline. And it was kind of, uh, I think it was a mistake to not sign him. It, it clearly based on what he's done for the Texas stars, they would have loved to have him with the Bakersfield Condors, uh, the Edmonton Oilers affiliate, but uh, you know, their, their loss is a, is a Dallas stars gain. More with Steven here in just a moment, but first I got to let you know that today's episode is also brought to you by eBay motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure every part you need fits just right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know that the part will fit. Or you'll get your money back. Because just like sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, You'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Yeah, certainly. And I didn't know that about he and Marion student each. I think that's awesome because I know we have that in the NHL too with Wyatt Johnston uh, living with Joe Pavelski and his family. So uh, I guess it just kind of runs all throughout the organization. Uh, guys helping one another out, which is super cool to hear. And one more player uh, that I kind of want to highlight individually, Matt Murray, who, who we've seen with some brief stints in the NHL this season, as well with uh, some injuries to Scott Wedgwood. Uh, do you think that he's also kind of, you know, the beneficiary now? We talk about Ottinger being the beneficiary of, uh, you know, some misfortune with, with Jack Campbell back in the day. And now we see Matt Murray come on. Not bad in the NHL. Obviously, I don't think he was fully ready to be an NHL goalie, but he did look bright in some moments, but it seems like he's had a pretty good year uh, with the Texas stars in the AHL. What, what, what's your take on Matt Murray and where do you see his career potentially taking him? Uh, Cause we talked about Jake Ottinger being the number one guy, but you know, Scott Wedgwood, good veteran, good backup, but he's not going to be around forever. Yeah, it never hurts to have a lot of options at goalie, right? Um, the Texas stars have had uh, a, a good stable of goalies with Matt Murray and, and Remy Poirier as well. Uh, both rookies, um, going into the playoffs, the, the Texas Stars are rolling with with two rookies as they roll into the playoffs. And, you know, we talked earlier about Jack Campbell and Jake Ottinger and their development. And I think this is a, a nice way to tie a little bow on it, because the fact that you have uh, Matt Murray as your number one going into the playoffs as a rookie, um, it's because they have this system built around him. Mm. Um, he the typical setup for an AHL playoff run in the past and an AHL roster is you have a younger prospect goalie, right? Like Jack Campbell. And then you have a more veteran experienced guy like Christopher Nielsdorf or back in 2018, there was Landon Bow and Mike McKenna that took them to the 2018 Calder cup final. But this shift 
where you're able to have two rookies is a really good uh, demonstration of the support system that's now formed around the goalie position in the organization. As far as what Matt Murray has done, I mean, he's the numbers, you know, he's, he's 18, 10 and five, um, you know, which fine numbers, right? Uh, almost twice as many wins as losses, but his goals against uh, is really, I think, pretty great. It's number four in the league. He actually has the best rookie goals against average in the American Hockey League at 2.37. Um, save percentage, 911, pretty, pretty solid save percentage, right? Um, overall, I think that this team is built from the net out. Scott White built teams always are. Uh, and Matt Murray is actually an interesting case study and something new um, that actually published a piece on today on 100 Degree Hockey of this two-year AHL contract concept. Um, this is something that Dallas Stars fans might want to pay attention to, where you see two-year contracts in the AHL being handed out to rookies. And normally that's not something that happens. Normally rookie con uh, rookie contracts are these one-year contracts. Um, and two-year deals are reserved for veterans, guys who might be your captain or something like that. This is an interesting way to stash players in the AHL give them options, but then also do something clever where you are protecting your contract limit. So you've got this guy, Matt Murray, who you think might be a future Dallas Stars uh, entry-level contract guy, but you're not exactly sure yet. You want to have a little bit more flexibility. Dallas has 48 out of their 50 allowed contracts right now. And so you stash him in the NHL, and if you need him, you can sign him to an NHL deal, but he also has the flexibility of he can sign with any NHL team because he's just on an AHL deal. Um, it's an interesting, clever little way that I've started to see happen. Um, Ethan DeJong just recently did this as well with the Bakersfield Condors and Zach Metza, both who played with Quinnipiac, who just won the NCAA Frozen Four, mm -hmm. uh, both did this exact same thing, uh, Metza with the Rochester Americans. And so this is an interesting thing that Matt Murray is part of um, and it's a clever strategy. And obviously it paid off because they signed him to an ELC in the middle of the year. He was able to play NHL games for the Dallas Stars when they really needed somebody. So it's an interesting strategy. One thing to remember with goalies, though, to your original question about his development, goalies take longer, period. It's fine. that you know It's good that Scott Wedgwood is locked in for another year because I wouldn't want Matt Murray to be coming up to back up Jake Gottinger quite yet. Get him lots of good seasoning, over ripen, as Jim Neal always likes to say, as we know and make sure he's ready to go when the time comes. Absolutely. That that seems to be the way to do it, and, and I agree with you 100%. It's nice that you have Wedgwood, who's been a very good backup here in Dallas all season for at, at least one more season, and then you can kind of go from there and weigh your options and see what you need to do to get Jake Gottinger uh, the proper backup, whether that be Matt Murray uh, or some other you know NHL veteran or someone else that you can go out and sign. And Got one more question for you before we finish with a couple playoff related ones. Uh, and this this one just kind of random, but one that I'm really just curious, someone who follows the Texas Stars so closely, your opinion on. There was the trade uh, around the trade deadline for the NHL. Jacob Peterson gets sent to San Jose for Scott Reedy. What, what was kind of your take on that deal? Because I, for one, really liked Jacob Peterson as a player. I enjoyed watching him in the NHL last season. Uh, it was told to me by people that follow the Dallas Stars closely and that are close to the organization that, Pete DeBoer just didn't necessarily care for Peterson, and that's why we didn't really ever see him play in the NHL this year. What, what was kind of your take on that whole deal? Was Reedy a guy that you think has some long-term capability with this organization? What, what was kind of your reaction to all that trade when it went down? Yeah, when it went down, you know, there's the cliche of the, the change of scenery trade, and it really was that. And, mm -hmm. and you always hope that those change of scenery trades work out well for both sides. You want both teams to get a player who's reinvigorated by the change and is able to jump in for Jacob Peterson. He was able to move over to the Barracuda and then eventually he got recalled to the sharks. He played NHL games this year, which he absolutely would not have done if he had stayed with the Dallas stars this year. Right. Scott Reedy was for my money, the best player on the Texas stars since he was traded to the Texas stars. He was scoring in buckets. He was a difference maker. He's on the power play. Like he was doing all of the things that you would want from a player, you know, in a trade. He, uh, he was really was a difference maker for this team and, and head coach Neil Graham called that out multiple times. Um, so really just a change of scenery trade. I don't know that Reedy has a long-term big future with the Dallas stars. It's another one of those things where um, the San Jose sharks organization is a little bit thinner at prospect depth. And so he played games with the sharks last year, but hadn't cracked the roster this year. 
Um, I don't know that he's in a position where he's going to be with the Dallas Stars in the future, but it was a great pickup for the Texas Stars. And he's an important piece of their playoff run, I think, moving forward. Sure. That, that's great to hear. And yeah, hopefully it works out for, for both parties. I think, you know, we saw a similar change of scenery trade with Denis Gurionov and Evgeny Dodonov, Montreal and Dallas. So uh, again, you always hope that it works out for everyone involved on both sides. But now we'll, we'll wrap up with a couple playoff related questions. We've talked about a ton of the players on the team, but in your, in your eyes, who's the X factor player or the player to keep an eye on for the Texas stars heading into this postseason? Uh, I feel like it, it might be easy to say Matt Murray. I know it's easy to kind of lean goaltender, but if you're going just purely based on the skaters, uh, who is one guy that you have your eye on here as the playoffs get rolling uh, for the stars on Friday? Yeah, that's a great question. And and you're right. Like it is always easy to say goaltender, but if we're going to go with, with skaters, I, I think that that's uh, I think that's a fair question. Um, you know, looking ac across the roster, the stars have been pretty like have had a lot of depth in scoring. Um, I think that, gosh, put me on the spot here, Dave. Um, <laughs> but I just looking through, I think I think one thing uh, to look at is is who is who's able to fill the hole that Thomas Harley leaves. So a guy like Michael Caro jumping in to the roster, Oscari Loxanen, our two guys on defense that I want to watch and make sure have you know uh, upward trajectories. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, Matt Bork and Matei Blumel. I think both of those guys as rookies on the forward side are, um, you know, they could, they could have really breakout, uh, times. Um, one thing I know Dallas stars prospect watchers will love that I'm saying this is I really think Antonio Stranges is a guy who could, who could break out. Um, he's had, uh, he spent a lot of the season in Idaho in the ECHL and then got called up, uh, in March and spent a lot of time just being a practice guy, healthy scratch. But then once he got placed into the lineup, he got an opportunity to play on the top line and was really a difference maker. Um, you know, little things clean up here and there, according to Coach Graham, but his game could translate really well in this off in, in, in a, a postseason situation. Um, I, I'm interested to see what he's able to do. Um, but the depth of the organization kept him in Idaho for so long. But I know that everybody's out there watching those YouTube highlights of, of the silly side, you know, sidewinder skating and all those uh -huh. sorts of things. He's brought that to the AHL level, but also has modified his game to play tougher and harder um, as well in the corners, on the, on the wall. Uh, and those are the things he needs to do to make a difference. So I'm really interested to see what happens with Stranges as these post, the postseason rolls on. Yeah, I'm glad you brought him up. I know a lot of my listeners will probably have wondered how we went this long without talking about Stranges. There's, there's a lot of uh, Stranges fans out there for for the Dallas Stars, uh, their fans and the people who are watching the prospects. So I'll be excited to see what he can do as well. Plenty of talent. Uh, it's just a matter of harnessing it and, and you know continuing to develop that talent. And the final question I have for you, Stephen, just a, a simple, how far will this Texas Stars team go? Uh, I know, I mean, it's a, a team that won the division an exciting year in Cedar park, it seems for this team, but how, how deep do you see this playoff run going for them? I mean, we have talked about it kind of in the, in the press box. We've I've chatted about it with coach Graham. It, this is a team that's built to go all the way. And I know a lot of teams say that, but we've seen, we've had the good fortune as Texas stars media and the Texas stars fans of watching three teams go to the final. And I have seen what it takes to do that. I, I think this team is built for that. They've got four lines that they can roll. They've got solid defense. The goaltending, as we talked about, is maybe the biggest question. But if they've got all those things in front of them and Matt Murray really gets hot, this is a team that could go to the final and be playing still in June. Um, we kind of joke that every four years, the Texas Stars go to the Calder Cup final. And if you take out the year that there were no playoffs, we're right on schedule because they last played in 2018, four playoffs since then. This, they're on schedule for a Calder Cup run. And uh, there are no easy uh, there are no easy rounds here. They have to play Rockford in the first round round, which is Chicago's affiliate. They played pretty tight and even throughout the season series. If they win, maybe they'll play Milwaukee in the next round. Milwaukee is Nashville's affiliate. Nashville sends a lot of players down because they missed the playoffs. That's a hard one as well. And then whoever's coming out of the Pacific Division, those two teams that were at the top of the Pacific Division, they were competing for the AHL equivalent of the President's Trophy all year better than 700 win percentage so that's a hard out as well so whoever gets to the call to cup final out of the western conference is going to be battle tested and i think the texas stars really do have a chance to make it all that way and still be playing hockey in june 
Yeah, that'd be really exciting to to have two teams here in the state of Texas battling deep into the postseason for their respective leagues. And uh, I, I know I'll be keeping a close eye on how the Texas Stars perform uh, here in this postseason, as well as the Dallas Stars. But Stephen, I appreciate you coming on. I want to give you a second. I know we talked about the book, uh, but is there anything else that, that you want to plug? Let the people know where they can find you and your work uh, and all that good stuff. No, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Dane. Uh, I've been covering the team for 14 years now uh, at 100degreehockey.com, just 100degreehockey.com. Uh, come check us out. Follow on Twitter as well. We'll be obviously following all the games, uh, both home and away, hoping if they go deep, we can maybe even go in person to some of these away games. It's always a fun thing to do to go on hockey road trips. And again, the book, which covers all this and more over the last 14 years with some great stories and, and remembrances and a lot of names that you'll recognize, um, you know, from Jamie Ben and uh, Ben Bishop all the way to, you know, some of the ones you might have forgotten, like uh, Justin <laughs> Peters or whoever else. Uh, I'm naming a lot of goalies, but there's always a lot of weird goalie stories in the AHL. So um, definitely excited. That book is We Win Here, and you can find it at wewinhere.com. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll, we'll have to be in touch. Maybe if the if the Texas Stars go on a deep run, we'll, we'll have to record another episode together. Absolutely. I'd love to tell you more about heading into the Western Conference Finals or the Calder Cup Finals in a few months. Let's do it. Let's hope it happens. Again, thank you to Stephen for coming on today's episode to get me, and I'm sure many of you as well, caught up to speed on everything we need to know about the Texas Stars in the AHL. Uh, pretty special that we have two teams here in the state of Texas going on playoff runs, and both of them uh, finishing very high in their divisions and in their conferences. Uh, incredible to see, and here's to hoping that the Dallas Stars and the Texas Stars both find themselves hoisting uh, their respective trophies at the end of the season. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Stars. Thank you so much again for tuning in and making us your first listen every single day. Be sure to subscribe to the show here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts at. We're always free and available no matter where or how you choose to listen or watch the show. Uh, we'll be right back here tomorrow as we get you set for game six of the first round Stanley Cup playoff series between the Stars and the Wild. We'll be talking about Miro Haskinen, Rope Hints, and the potential return of Joe Pavelski to the lineup. It's going to be a fun episode and should be a fun game six. Hopefully the conclusion of this first round series as the stars look to clinch in St. Paul. But I hope you guys have a great Thursday. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. <laughs>